companies and organizations that have been hit by a cyber attack. As we heard from Rick, um, it will happen or has happened to all of us, all of you. Uh, it's something you cannot avoid. Uh, so the best thing we can do is uh, take lessons learned and try to be as well prepared as possible. This morning we already talked about forensic readiness. Uh, now we will look rather into uh, lessons learned and what have companies and organizations done to improve uh, their preparedness to, to deal with attacks and also at the other side, at the side of the organizations uh, providing assistance uh, to hacked organizations. What do they expect? What kind of recommendations would they give uh, so that the whole process will go more smoothly and that uh, in a better way, we can try to catch the criminals. Um, I had a similar panel at the former uh, version of ICSS, ICSS 2013, where I actually had three Dutch people in the panel. Uh, they were talking about uh, an ING case, KPN case, and there was somebody from Fox IT then, that it was the beginning of September, and this guy was saying, I've been in Belgium uh, very often lately, and nobody at that time, or not many people at that time, knew why, but uh, I think one week later, uh, we all find out in the press, because uh, there was a major uh, incident at Belgacom. Um, so already then it was foretold that uh, this year, uh, we can have Belgian people talking about their experiences, uh, it was a solid promise I made also that this year I wanted to have Belgians in the panel and although it's due to some unfortunate incidents that they're here, but I'm very happy to have uh, four Belgian representatives. And we'll start with uh, Fabrice Clément, uh, who is working at uh, Proximus and who uh, since 2013 is in charge of the security governments and investigations for the Belgacom group and he has been very busy. He's also one of the, the really uh, supporting uh, persons for the creation of the Cybersecurity Coalition in Belgium. So I will give him the floor. He will explain briefly the experience of Belgacom. Thank you. Should <coughs> yeah. No. Should I? Otherwise, uh, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's okay. Start. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, on the 16th of September, uh, Balcom announced to the to the public that we were uh, we have been victim of uh, cyber intrusion in our systems. Uh, I think we are one of the only. Uh, enterprise having communicated about uh, such cyber intrusion in their systems. So we have been hit by um, a state-sponsored attack. Uh, it was um, probably a state-sponsored espionage attack. The story started a few weeks before. And on of June, our security team discovered uh, a malware on one of our internal uh, email servers. So we we found also traces of this malware on other servers, and then we we called international expertise. And Fox IT came on board. Uh, we did two weeks of uh, the in-depth investigations, and we we uh, came quickly to the conclusion that it was not a kind of usual attack. It was a, a very sophisticated attack, uh, one of the, the, the most uh, advanced malware uh, never seen before, fully encrypted, several layers of encryption, uh, very well hidden. Uh, the, the attacker uh, covered all the tracks. Um, so what did we do? We filed a complaint with the federal prosecutor, and uh, Geert uh, Skouros was there already. Um, we worked together with the competent authorities, uh, mainly the, the Federal Computer Crime Unit, the uh, intelligence service of the uh, Belgian Defense, uh, Miguel was there also, uh, intelligence service of the state, and the CERT. 
Uh, we worked also together with BIPT. Uh, we shared a lot of information with BIPT. BIPT is the national regulator for the telecommunications. Uh, and they shared also this information with the other uh, critical infrastructure in Belgium, also together with, with the CERT. So um, we worked together in close collaboration with these uh, authorities, and we worked for two months with about 200 people, internal people, employees, um, in full confidentiality. And we started two tracks. The first track was the investigation. So the goal of the investigation was really to determine the exact scope of the infection, which servers, which workstations were infected, and also to determine the indicator of compromise uh, in order really to, to determine this uh, full scope. In parallel, we uh, prepared, we elaborated a remediation plan. Uh, uh, so based on this indicator of compromise, we scanned all our systems, 26,000 of IT systems were scanned. And we executed this plan during one weekend, the weekend of the 14 and the 15 September, just, just before the communication we did. Um, so there we um, decided not to take any risk. We decided to replace all the systems with brand new system. We changed all the passwords. So we, again, we had 200 people on site during that weekend. Um, and it was uh, successful, so we did not have any impact on our business during that weekend and even after. Some key factors, uh, some key success factors to deal with such kind of incidents. Uh, first of all, we had already a CSO team in place. So this is the team who will handle the incident from day one. This is also the team who will escalate the incident looking to the severity. Uh, in our case, it was escalated directly to the top management. So this team need to have direct contact with top management. We had also uh, in place a crisis uh, management team. Uh, so first of all, a kern made of top management representative from all the, the line of businesses. Uh, meaning legal, communication, IT, so the technical experts, uh, procurement also was there. Uh, so you really need to have th this kind of cross-functional uh, crisis management team. We had already also a crisis process in place. What was new in this case, that was the confidentiality uh, perspective. And I will come back on, on confidentiality because this is al also a very important point. And we had several crisis teams, uh, one uh, for investigation, one for remediation, and one for communication. A strong governance is also needed. Uh, a strong involvement of the, the, the executive management and the board. So we made a reporting to our CEO every day we went to our management committee quite every week, so they got the last information and they decided about the, the next steps. And we made also uh, reporting, regular reporting to the external directors uh, of the board. You need an agile organization, meaning that you have to monopolize 200 people uh, one day to the other to take out of the normal business the uh, best experts that you have in each of the uh, different function, different domain. You need also to monopolize budget because it has a cost. Uh, in our case, it was several millions euro. Confidentiality was uh, really a key element in all the story. So all the people on board had to sign a non-disclosure agreement and nobody had the complete picture. So people had just the information necessary to deal with their task. So we were uh, four or five people having really the complete picture. 
And this, this is a key success factor to, to keep this confidentiality. Why did we have to keep confidentiality? Because this was uh, um, necessary for the uh, remediation and for uh, the investigation. Also, we developed a complete parallel communication network. So not communicating anymore on, on our network, internal network, uh, not printing anything on the, on the machine, uh, not sending any emails from our uh, own email accounts. So it was completely separate from our uh, corporate network. Last but not least, you have also to, to fulfill your legal obligations. So in our case, we are a stock uh, exchange uh, quoted company. So uh, we had to, to notify the FSMA, the regulator for, uh, for a quoted company. Uh, also the BIPT, uh, we have uh, an obligation under the law of telecom law uh, to notify BEPT of uh, our uh, incidents. So this you have to fulfill. Now communication was, was vital. Um, you have to take into account the different stakeholders, customers, the, the general public, so the press, but also your shareholders, your uh, customers from different segments, the corporate customer does not have the same concern as a, a residential customer. So it uh, needed uh, an intensive preparation. We write a lot of Q&A uh, with the most nasty questions. So you have to ask yourself a uh, very sensitive question and it helped a lot. Uh, you have to know that you cannot really control the press. So uh, they, will, they will tell the story like they, they want. Mm. Uh, we did it in a transparent way, so uh, we did it based on known and verified elements, and we did not enter into any speculation. And the press will do for you, for sure, so do not uh, enter into any speculation. Uh, also, communication was key uh, in order to preserve the, the legal investigation, so that we did not communicate everything at any time. Uh, so it was important also to, to preserve this uh, investigation. Collaboration with the, the legal authorities. Uh, we had several joint meetings with the Federal Prosecutor Office, together with the different experts, also our own experts. Um, Something important, you have to manage two different objectives. First of all, getting as much as evidence during the investigation, but on the other side, you want to remediate, you want to do a full cleanup. So by essence, it means removing all the evidence. Uh, in our case, as we were uh, um, a critical infrastructure, decision was quickly taken to get priority, to put priority on the remediation. So uh, we had two months to, to do the remediation. Also, from, from um, a complexity perspective, you have to understand that people coming from, uh, from the federal police or from, from uh, the other expert domain, they do not really master such kind of complex infrastructure, like the one of a telecom uh, operator. So they, they have to go through a learning curve, so you spend quite a lot of effort also to explain and to determine what would be really the important uh, topics to cover. Preservation of evidence, make sure that you take forensics copy as much as possible before the remediation and also make sure that you have traceability of these forensic copies. So when we uh, handled such kind of forensic uh, copies, uh, it was uh, with um, a tracing, a tracing a paper signed by, by, by the people during the handover. Now, uh, we had already quite a long experience in cybersecurity, but with this uh, experience, uh, with this incident, we gained quite a unique expertise. And uh, we incorporate this experience in our cybersecurity program. 
you have to cover the governance, uh, reviewing your, your policy, um, uh, strengthening your organization with, with expertise. Um, something which is also very important, you have to integrate security in the development life cycle of your solution, of your products, and you have to test also your product. So uh, what is called uh, uh, ethical hacking, we have a team of, uh, of hackers uh, testing permanently the new solution, the new product that we are bringing uh, within our network or on the market. Um, strengthening the architecture, working on three different axes, uh, limit the entry point, limit the propagation, limit the risk of theft. This is the more technical measures uh, like we, we heard from, from Rick also in the previous presentation, uh, IDS, firewall, and so on. But not only, uh, uh, for instance, we removed all the administrator rights of the employees on their own PC, on their own uh, workstation. Uh, we increased also the segmentation in the network. And we, okay, and we, uh, uh, and we worked also on, on encryption. Monitoring, so zero risk does not exist. You will be, you have to assume that you will be compromised one day or another. So monitoring is really important, but not only monitoring from your firewalls or your locks, you have also to integrate monitoring in the network. Monitoring what's going on in your own network, putting sensors at the, the right place, having a team uh, monitoring permanently these uh, security alerts. And you have to train your own people. Uh, changing the culture, raising the awareness. So last year, for instance, we, we attacked our own people. We launched a massive uh, phishing campaign to all our employees, and it was really uh, impacting for them. So this is really important. Now, I think, this is the measure that you can take at the level of, the org of your organization, but cybersecurity is going beyond. And uh, the, the more important point for me would be collaboration beyond the, the border of your organization. Uh, we have already developed a, a large collaboration framework uh, at national and international level, and we launched uh, a few months ago the cybersecurity coalition with, with 50 key actors in Belgium in order to join the force and to raise the uh, uh, cybersecurity capability. Voila, for me. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you, Fabrice. Uh, the only thing that changes for the next speaker is the first name, because the second name is the same. So we have another Mr. Clement um, from one critical infrastructure to the other. Uh, Mr. Cl Robert Clement is working with PSA Antwerp, but he will be talking here on behalf of, as a chairman of the Port of Antwerp Cybersecurity Task Force. It's currently renamed to Port Isaac. Also there, there was a, a main case, uh, and he will be telling us more about it and the, the measures that have been taken since. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon to you all. Um, as I said, uh, I'm here talking as uh, the chairman of the, the, the ISAC in the, the port of Antwerp, uh, which was uh, introduced uh, uh, more than a year ago now. And um, the reason for it was that uh, suddenly uh, we were part of uh, a cyber attack. Uh, nobody knew it. Uh, everything was working fine. Uh, volumes were increasing. And uh, uh, even uh, people were telling we're not... Uh, the most sexy company that will be hacked. So uh, why invest in, um, in uh, information security? But uh, uh, a quick presentation, um, a movie uh, will illustrate what happened. The ah. European News now, because the head of Europe's law enforcement agencies warned of the growing risk of international criminal groups using cyber attacks to traffic drugs.
follows an IT attack on the port of Antwerp in which hackers breach the system that controls container movements in an attempt to transport hundreds of kilos of cocaine and heroin. Tom Bateman reports. This is one of the world's busiest container ports. 15,000 ships pass through Antwerp every year. It is a major European hub for cargo. But like many other ports, Antwerp faces a constant threat from traffickers who attempt to hide drugs among legitimate goods in containers. Well, this part of the port deals with 10,000 containers every day. It's controlled by a vast IT system that tells the crane drivers where to move the containers to. Now, earlier this year, that IT system was hacked into and some crucial details changed, meaning that specific containers loaded with drugs could be moved from here with no security checks. The traffickers are alleged to have hidden hundreds of kilos of drugs in legitimate containers shipped to Antwerp from South America. The breach of the port's computer systems began remotely using malicious emails and then became more audacious. This is installed on a computer and it locks all the keystrokes. The hackers breached the IT system controlling container movements in the port. They accessed vast quantities of data, including the security codes and location of cargo, and were then able to steal entire containers that the drugs had been stashed into. They started breaking into the companies and installing hardware uh, and linked that hardware to the servers from the, from the companies. This hardware allowed them from distance to log in to the servers from the companies. After the plot was discovered, police seized a record amount of heroin like this haul from a previous container raid, as well as 130 million pounds worth of pure cocaine. A number of suspects were held and officers seized a machine gun and silencer, bulletproof vests and more than a million euros in cash. Fifteen people are currently awaiting trial. Last week, police from a number of countries met at the headquarters of Europe's crime-fighting agency to discuss the cyber attack, a first of its kind, they say, which threatens to become a more prominent feature of drug trafficking. We have effectively a service-orientated industry where, indeed, uh, organized crime groups are paying for specialist hacking skills um, that they can uh, acquire online and using, taking away that skill, therefore, to go off and do their everyday business. The authorities in Antwerp say they've strengthened security at the port. The focus for the police will now be on the combined threat of drug trafficking and cybercrime. Tom Bateman, BBC News. That'd be weather of a novel if it wasn't actually fact. It's quite a story. So uh, we're back here on the front. So that uh, illustrates uh, uh, quite well, in fact, what uh, all happened. Uh, a little bit uh, uh, exaggerated, but um, it comes up to, to the point that uh, criminals uh, were hacking into our systems. Now, legally speaking, hacking uh, also means that uh, somebody uses your ID and your password to use uh, it uh, on behalf of yourself uh, on the system. So uh, when I was uh, confronted uh, with uh, the federal police coming to tell me like um, a system has been uh, hacked uh, was quite a surprise. Now uh, we had uh, some uh, problems uh, up front uh, and that uh, was an indication of uh, uh, those attempts. So um, uh, one uh, evening I got a phone call from uh, our internal communication uh, or external communication manager saying well we send out uh, a newsletter, company newsletter, I received it back as a PDF. Uh, attached. Uh, we all know that triggers an update and uh, if you're not protected well then uh, malware gets installed. Uh, luckily if you have uh, your parameter security uh, in place uh, that prevents uh, you from uh, being uh, vulnerable. Of course smaller companies who do not have that protection in place are vulnerable and uh, their information uh, was sent then in uh, phishing mails or uh, uh, from those newsletters to uh, the criminals. We also saw in the, the picture in the movie uh, what devices were used, uh, like uh, the small keylogger. Uh, you cannot uh, uh, demand from uh, your end user that they each time uh, check all the ins and outs interfaces from your devices, from their PCs, if there's something uh, changed in it. And then a bigger device in there, like uh, the power block, uh, was found. Um, those are uh, regular uh, tools uh, in uh, the offices, but uh, only two ports were used. The rest was uh, equipped, uh, were used for uh, the space 
to hide um, a data communication uh, device in it, so over the, the telephone system. Um, also, and as the, the worst case, bribery, uh, customs uh, were uh, paid uh, money uh, to, um, to work together with the criminals, and also employees uh, were approached and uh, offered money to uh, retrieve uh, confidential information so that containers could be released. When uh, those uh, activities uh, happened, um, the police uh, came in, we worked together with uh, the police. Uh, in fact, a um, few months we let them uh, just uh, work on so that we can, uh, could analyze uh, what was happening there. Um, and there was no difference than uh, normal users, except that some containers were requested for estimated time of arrivals more often than others. Uh, and uh, it could be derived that the normal uh, transportation company from, uh, say from Germany was not using anymore a fixed IP address in Germany, but a mobile IP address from um, a prepaid card in Holland and used in Belgium. So correlating all this uh, made it possible to uh, retrieve uh, who was doing what uh, with the information. So, um, as an initiative from the Anthroport community system, um, yeah, uh, a task force was uh, established uh, last year, uh, in which we uh, have the objective to have a, a public and private collaboration. Uh, the idea is uh, we all in the same sector, we use each other's information, so there is an information chain uh, flow, and the, the weakest uh, link in uh, in the information chain, doesn't have to be necessarily in your company. It could be uh, one of your partners or your uh, customers. And uh, yeah, there we would speak about the, um, the mitigations uh, we have in place, but on a high level, not on too technical uh, level. Uh, to organize that, uh, we would um, establish breakout sessions. And uh, we have the support there from the uh, CRT.be. Uh, to coordinate uh, all uh, our, uh, our meetings. And uh, the goal is yeah, that we have a cooperation between all the stakeholders uh, in the port community, because we're all involved in that same uh, chain. So these are the participating companies. Um, in there. And uh, on the right, you see their, um, uh, their function. Uh, immediately see that. There are various uh, uh, types of uh, roles uh, in there, financial, IT, uh, physical security. Now, physical security is uh, one of the top uh, um, uh, concerns uh, in the port. We have to comply with the ISPS uh, uh, code, meaning that uh, we have uh, barbed wire, uh, uh, concrete blocks, digital cameras everywhere. Uh, but now, uh, the awareness is there that we also have to uh, invest uh, heavily in uh, information security. Uh, how do we work? We have formal meetings uh, with a uh, good agenda. Everybody, everybody puts his um, uh, information in uh, there, his requests, his points that he wants to talk about. Uh, we have a chairman, so myself and a secretary, so that we have the minutes uh, taken. We limited uh, the um, amount of uh, talk about uh, two hours and uh, come together every two or three months. And uh, there are only two persons allowed from uh, each company. Uh, to participate, and uh, we do not allow to have uh, uh, stand-ins so that we can uh, establish uh, a trust relation. And with uh, 20 persons in total, uh, we have also an active group uh, where we can uh, talk about those things. So everybody participates, uh, delivers information in order to also receive information. And uh, it's always uh, better to learn from uh, an incident you, you didn't suffer yourself. Um, uh, some incidents you can only suffer once. Um, we got the, the information also from other uh, Isaacs uh, in the world, uh, from, uh, from Holland, and the chairman of the Dutch Sports uh, Arto participated in the setup of our uh, working together, and also the NPCI and uh, ENISA uh, were consulted. So we established a trust relationship. We uh, try to uh, uh, gain value from our uh, conferences, and uh, we ask uh, for a commitment for, uh, from any participant uh, in order to uh, uh, come to the goal that you can suffer an incident uh, and that you can do it uh, better the next time. 
uh, probably you are uh, familiar with this uh, classification of uh, information. So if uh, confidential information is uh, shared, and uh, then the uh, originator can uh, say that it needs to uh, be kept uh, inside in the team or uh, that it can be used uh, in uh, his own uh, company. We wanted to have a sort of um, yeah, self-assessment, like where are we and where do we need to, to go to, to what level of um, uh, security measures that we need to have in place. Now, you have to uh, imagine that uh, information security culture uh, in the port operations is not uh, at all companies at the same level. Uh, you have uh, smaller companies, bigger companies, multinationals uh, in there. Uh, so uh, we started uh, with the Belgian uh, cybersecurity guide uh, to do the uh, to be used as a self-assessment, and uh, we're aiming to uh, provide uh, a label uh, that we can uh, attach to uh, all the partners who are uh, participating in that uh, information chain in uh, the port community. So. That was it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have speakers keeping to the time. That's great. The next speaker actually um, is from here, I think from Leuven. He worked uh, at the university as a uh, researcher, assistant is researcher at the law faculty. Uh, after that, he became a prosecutor here in Leuven, and then three years ago, uh, he joined uh, the Federal Prosecutor's Office and became uh, specialized in cybercrime. We actually run the, the training together for cybercrime, if I remember well, at the Institute for Juridical Training, um, but he's much better at it than I. Uh, so he will uh, tell the point of view of a prosecutor on the cases that you're dealing with and uh, expectations to help the, the work progress. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will try to rush through my uh, slides because we are slightly ahead of, um, no, not ahead, back of the schedule. Um, the Federal Prosecutor's Office is not, is not dealing with the bulk of cases, uh, criminal cases in Belgium. We are just uh, working on a selection of cases, mainly uh, terrorism cases and uh, some uh, more complex cases of organized crime, among which also a selection of cases of uh, cybercrime. Uh, what we call, what we would call, we were mainly interested in what we call alpha cases, cases which break new grounds for Belgian prosecution. We try to boldly go where no prosecutor has gone before in Belgium. Uh, and this was specifically the case two years ago with uh, the Belgacom case as the very first case where we were confronted with a uh, very complex uh, APT uh, infection, a major a targeted cyber intrusion where we were within a national critical infrastructure, uh, where we were confronted with a very specific and very complex ICT environment. Uh, we were not confronted with a standalone PC which was infected. We were within in the heart of a telephone company uh, with a large network. An infection of an utmost uh, complexity, it has been uh, told uh, already by uh, the predecessors. Uh, and this while the infection was still present in the organization, um, summer of 2013. So we were confronted with a very challenging uh, investigatory uh, setting, because the classical setting for a prosecutor when starting an investigation is that he has a police service to work with, or sometimes uh, more than uh, two or three police services he has to take uh, into account the interests uh, of the victim and uh, he's going after the suspects. And what he has to do is uh, balancing all the interests involved, interests of the investigation uh, versus some interests of the involved parties and of course also the interests of the public which has certain rights to be informed of what is uh, going on even when in an ongoing investigation. The situation was slightly more complex uh, there was an, we were confronted with an inflation of interest, an inflation of parties involved that had some kind of saying in uh, this uh, investigation. First of all, clearly, uh, there was an interest of the secret services, uh, the intelligence services, 
as we were dealing with state-sponsored uh, malware, uh, the infection amounted to what we call a hostile foreign activity, which is in the core business, of course, of uh, intelligence services. In some countries, this is enough to transfer the whole investigation to uh, the Secret Service. Uh, so it is not um, more than logic, logical that intelligence services are closely involved in the criminal uh, investigation. Also, political authorities were very concerned about what uh, was going on. Uh, it was We were dealing with an infection of a national critical infrastructure, which could have an impact on national uh, security and public uh, order. Uh, it was already explained that uh, there, is an, uh, there was a cleaning up, a clean up weekend, uh, which entailed, of course, certain risks. There was a massive operation going on within uh, the network. And of course, uh, also uh, national security might uh, be uh, affected if something goes wrong, which means that uh, we have to put some uh, infrastructure in place uh, whenever uh, that would, would uh, happen. And that, of course, is a legitimate interest of which political authorities have to be informed. Apart from that, of course, we are dealing with espionage, espionage which could clearly have an immediate impact on international uh, relations, another reason to involve political uh, authorities, or at least to have a line of communication with uh, the political authorities, which would for us be uh, our line through the Ministry of uh, Justice. Another group are the supervisory authorities or uh, other supporting authorities like uh, BIPT, uh, the British, uh, the British, the Belgian, the Belgian Institute on Postal and Telecommunication Services, uh, the search community, um, which all have their own uh, responsibilities, uh, which require sometimes uh, transfer and exchange of uh, information. For example, when they are uh, ready to screen other nation national critical infrastructure uh, based on uh, the indicators of compromise from this uh, infection. Belgacom being uh, a stock exchange company, of course, we have to take into account uh, the characteristics of the stock markets. Uh, an untimely disclosure uh, of what was going on could have an immediate negative effect on uh, share prices. Uh, our communication strategy has to had to be uh, adopted uh, to take into account these characteristics uh, communication before or after uh, before the opening or after closure uh, of the stock exchange uh, was uh, preferable finally there is of course also an important input of private uh, expertise expertise uh, brought in before uh, the reporting by uh, the victim uh, itself with whom we had to build a certain working uh, relationship. relationship. Uh, very valuable expertise job that had been done, valuable in both senses. It was very interesting for us to incorporate in our, uh, in our investigation. Valuable also in terms of cost, of course. Uh, a lot of uh, money uh, was already uh, put into this expertise. Uh, it would be impossible for us to double this uh, expertise and to, uh, to pay uh, this bill. I have to say it as it is. Uh, so we went thr through, we, we tried to, to put up a uh, some kind of a validation process of the work that had been done by the private uh, expert in order to, um, bring this to, to bring this up to a level where we could use it as evidence, if necessary, uh, in uh, court. Some kind of a validation process which was taken care of by military uh, intelligence. Then I skip a few slides. So what were, what were the main problems we were uh, confronted with? First of all, an important lack of investigatory capacity for this kind of investigations. Uh, we were indeed in need of very uh, specific uh, expertise within law enforcement, uh, intelligence services and the prosecution. We were confronted with a, with a very specific setting, as I explained already, very large uh, networks with specific operating systems working in it. Um, for other APT um, 
investigations. We are also mostly working in an English environment, which could seem rather trivial, but we have to find not only skilled uh, police officers, but they could have also to be able to express themselves in English in uh, multinational environments, etc. We also need specific skills for this kind of investigations, skills we uh, didn't uh, have to use before. Uh, malware detection skills, uh, malware analysis skills, this decryption uh, skills, uh, and so on. We were also in need of trusted private uh, expertise, not only in the Belgacom case, but also in other APT uh, investigations. We need expertise that is skillful, but in cases of espionage, also expertise which can be trusted in terms of is there no danger to national security. We are working in an environment which is slight, getting slightly paranoid. We're working in cases of espionage. We never know who is who. If we bring in foreign uh, expertise, are they really who they tell they are? Aren't we communicating uh, expertise to perhaps the enemy? So all these elements make that th we have to find some, we have to build up some relationship with trusted private uh, expertise, which at the same time is still payable for a p very poor uh, government in uh, times of austerity. Our conclusion was that, that each police and intelligence service on its own was simply had not enough capability and expertise to take on such a case like the Belgacom case or other cases that uh, came uh, later on uh, to successfully tackle uh, and handle these kinds of uh, investigations. So what we had to do, uh, we had no choice, is to join forces simply to be able to tackle this kind of uh, investigations. So we had to overcome perhaps a bit of distrust because of the fact that we didn't know each other and uh, try to build trust among each other and to build a working uh, relationship. And as a matter of fact, right now, these kind of investigations are always uh, taken on uh, with joint uh, forces. Um, the Federal Prosecutor's Office will uh, work with the Federal Computer Crime Unit and mostly also with the Regional Computer Crime Unit of the capital, uh, Brussels, and will bring in um, on a systematic basis, as experts, the intelligence services, the, the military intelligence service and state uh, security, who are appointed officially in the criminal investigation as an expert, which gives us the opportunity to share information, which gives them the opportunity to bring in contextual information and to bring in their specific expertise. For example, expertise in decryption of malware in analysis of uh, malware. We also uh, put some effort in building a good working relationship with the search communities um, in order to be able to uh, use them as well uh, in order to um, spread the IOCs to verify other sectors, other net national critical infrastructure if they, that the infection might have uh, been spread to, to them uh, as well. Another thing which I really want to stress is that we had to work also uh, on building trust, trust with the victims, and we were very glad that Belgacom had the courage to come forward very early in the stage uh, of uh, the infection uh, to work uh, together uh, with us. This is uh, not an obvious uh, step, um, but it gave, which gave us the opportunity to to um, to work together and to take also account of the to take um, into account the uh, interests of uh, the investigation at a very uh, early uh, stage. So we're very happy that Belgacom took this step, and um, because there is a big problem, uh, we are. Um, big problem of underreporting in general. We are convinced that a lot of uh, infections go unreported and are not noticed by law enforcement and uh, uh, by the prosecution, which, uh, which means that we don't have an overall view of the problem 
and we will not be able to tackle efficiently intrusions and to build up uh, capacity needed to tackle the whole, uh, the whole problem as a whole. Um, so, uh, I, think, I think we tried not to, not to shame the trust that uh, Belgacom uh, invested in us. We tried to, to be careful um, uh, to be to be careful and to take care of the concerns of the victim, of course, uh, that uh, our work um, should not lead to further damage uh, to the victims. I think that that's one of the main reasons why there is a, um, a hesitation with a lot of victims to report uh, a crime. Uh, they think that we will come in, uh, we will uh, disconnect all the servers, take them home and uh, leave the company behind uh, without any functioning. Uh, ICT system, um, or uh, by, for example, uh, um, untimely informing uh, the press of what has uh, been going on. I think we managed to keep everything very confident, uh, though many people had to be informed also within uh, the police uh, forces and intelligence forces. In return, we can also offer some assistance, some advice um, in, uh, for example, the cleanup. Uh, by convincing the victim not to go too hastily into the cleanup process, uh, to be very vigilant that there might be back doors which have to be detected first before engaging into a cleanup, because an untimely cleanup will uh, lead uh, to uh, a reinfection a few weeks or months later uh, by uh, the intruder. We also invested a lot, and I will uh, stop with that, in uh, building intelligence capacity within uh, the Federal Computer Crime uh, Unit, which has proven to be a real catalyst for the detection of many new APT infections uh, in Belgium. Uh, Belgium seems to be very attractive uh, for APTs. We have a concentration of international institutions, um, diplomatic missions, uh, ministries, etc., uh, which uh, makes us very interesting uh, for uh, foreign uh, activity. So what is the outcome? The outcome of such kind of investigations, when you look at it in terms of prosecution or conviction, it might be rather poor. It will not be easy to, uh, to identify an individual who is responsible for an APT uh, infection. Uh, but there are, of course, more, um, more ways of uh, outcome. For example, uh, there could be it, uh, it's uh, very interesting for politics uh, uh, to know what has happened and perhaps to take some diplomatic uh, measures um, when there is enough evidence gathered about uh, the, the origin uh, of the infection. And of course, and that is the mo this is perhaps the most important element, uh, it, is, it has been a learning curve. We started from scratch uh, and it is still a learning curve and we insist on investing further on these APT investigations, because what today shows itself as a form of government espionage uh, will resurface tomorrow uh, as industrial espionage between multinationals, as uh, forms of uh, organized cybercrime that um, we fear this day the most, which could, which could ref ref resurface uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow as a form of organized cyber terrorism, where the APTs, the technology, will be adapted not to steal uh, surreptitiously information, but to make the most harm possible uh, and uh, to create chaos and uh, death. And that's why we keep on investing uh, in uh, this kind of uh, investigations. Um, our last speaker, uh, thank you, Geert. <laughs> so there seems to be positive sides at uh, ki this kind of attacks. Uh, Miguel de Bruyker is the head of the information security at the Belgian Federal Public Service of Defense, uh, the service that was mentioned several times uh, by Geert, and he will give his point of view on uh, yeah, lessons learned from uh, attack cases and expectations. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm actually not a product of the house, I'm a product of the VOB. <coughs> Sorry for the curse. Uh, so, yeah, well, in 2006 we started up a program and the goal was to protect 
our networks to detect intrusions and to respond to them. And actually, we ended up with building up a lot of expertise in malware detection, malware analysis and incident handling. And actually, that was not a deliberate choice. We were driven that way. Some lessons learned. Actually, I have to say, most of what I have on my slides has already been told. So um, I'll tell you a little bit of story. Um, some networks need more security. So you have the standard level of security, but for some networks, that is not enough. What we see in most incidents that we have been handling for the last few years is that actually the victim had quite a good level of security. So everybody thinks, well, probably there was a hole in the security. Well, to be honest, their security was good. So why have they been hacked? Well, simply because they were sexy. They had good asset value and they had someone that had the ability and the intention to harm them. That can be another state, that can be a, somebody from a competition, or even better, that can be your wife, for instance. No, that's sexy, that's probably not a threat. But they had good security. Their security level actually was quite good. And still, the, most of those intrusions stay undetected for quite a long time, and we're not talking about days. We're sometimes not even talking about months, but rather years. So, as the guy from Ten, uh, Trent Micro said, antivirus is good. You need an antivirus. It's the low, it takes the low-hanging fruit. But let's be honest, those counterparts, they have access to those antivirus products. They buy them, they craft their attacks so that they are sure that it will remain undetected. And believe me, you have strong counterparts. We have seen quite interesting stuff. Uh, for instance, malware that is linked to your calendar and that is doing some automatic follow-up of your calendar. And if, if you have a meeting with other people assigned to your meeting, it will automatically, during that period, activate your microphone and register the communication or whatever passes the microphone. And when it has a connection to the internet, it will send over that information. And you say, I will certainly see that. Hmm. No, you don't. In communication, they know that if they communicate with a server somewhere in Kazakhstan or India or Somalia or whatever, well, probably you'll notify that. So what they do is that they build another layer of infected systems in your environment. So in, in a lot of cases, we see that, for instance, in, in Belgium, they infect other systems because the victim or the target was communicating with those entities and, well, they found a way to enter their systems and to communicate through those other networks. So you see a communication with an entity that you have been communicating with for years. And they don't know, excuse me, they don't know that they are now also infected simply be as, as a gateway to another hub. And that counterpart will provide at least five hops and quite often also some SATCOM communication to make sure that they are undetected. So, yes, it is very complex and no, you will probably not see it by yourself. If you have an incident, who will handle it? IT? No. Your CEO or your management will handle the incident. What I mean is that it's management that makes the decisions. So if we set up uh, an intervention team, we need a direct link to the management. For the last case, we had the daily technical meeting with the technical teams every morning at 9 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, we had the management meeting. All the decisions were made at the management meeting. So we evaluate the risks, the advantages, the disadvantages, different options, and we propose a solution to the management. It is the management that decides. They have to be involved if you have a major incident. Otherwise, you'll have your management saying, whatever those decisions you have taken, we don't like that. You have to evaluate the risks fast and bring in real experts. Don't think that you can handle stuff like that by yourself. And you have to take care of that together because your IT department is not to blame. At the end, they must get the fame. What I mean is that 
that IT department, you must know that they will feel a little bit guilty. They feel attacked. They have an intrusion in their network. So they think, oh my goodness, I haven't done my job properly. And actually, most of the times they did. So you have to make sure that you have them in that team working together. Talk about it, but when the time is right. And actually, I think most of that has been said before. Um, you need a communication plan. And don't forget to involve your legal department. Why? Well, you have to think very carefully if you will file a complaint and when you will do that. At some entity, uh, commercial entity, legal department maintained a list of people that were uh, aware of, of the incident, that knew what was happening. And everybody on the list knew that he could only talk to other people on the list. And you have to make them liable. They even went that far and say, if you leak out what is happening now, we will find you and you, could, you can pay for all the damages. I assure you, nobody talked. In other cases, where we were in a political environment, we briefed the political environment on Friday, on Saturday morning, it was in the newspapers. Although it was legally classified. Wow. Make people liable. Um, and prepare a clear message. Also talk about when and with who to share indicators of compromise. Yes, you have to do that. You have to make sure that what has been found on your network is shared with other, for instance, AV vendors or with other entities, similar entities, so that they are capable of defending themselves. Why shouldn't you communicate immediately? Why is it so important to have that list of people that trust each other and only talk to each other? Well, if you get sick, you first identify that you have, for instance, a severe disease. You go to a doctor and says, mm, let me send you to a surgeon. That surgeon will first of all do a diagnosis. He will not say, okay, lay down or cut out a small piece. You need a complete diagnosis. And then, of course, you have the surgery. And for surgery, you bring down that person, you bring down your network, narcosis, and you do the surgery. You, bring out, you take out the pieces that you have diagnosed that are sick, and then you wake up the people. You have a recovery plan, and you need a follow-up at the end. Well, with Incident, cyber incident, it's more or less the same. When you, but here, when we're doing the diagnosis, you have to stay more or less silent. Yes, you have to talk to the media, but not too fast. And yes, you have to take action, but not immediately. You have to protect your forensics and your evidence, that has been said before, but you need a good plan. plan. You have to plan your intervention. Fabrice said, said that for Belgacom, they had been working for two months before the cleanup operation was started. That is important. There was, I think, not even one server that had been taken out during that diagnosis phases. Why is that? Well, more or less it has been said before too. That counterpart, when he knows, oh my goodness, I have been seen, it's in the newspaper, and yes, they can translate Dutch to whatever. It takes a little time, that's all. Well, they, they can do three things. They can try to steal the last crown jewels. To be honest, it's between brackets because they probably won't do that, but they will escape. They will try to erase all the traces and they will install back doors. And believe me, they will try to come back. In as good as all cases, we have seen that the enemy or the adversary tries to come back and to get sin again. And for instance, in one case, we had set up, we had copied the uh, infected system uh, with the malware that communicated uh, outbound to the internet. And we had created a network, a small network that we called uh, Winnie the Pooh, uh, because it was like a honeypot. Um, and so we continued the communication with the adversary to see what happened, but there was nothing behind anymore. There wasn't a big network, it was like a very small network. And that was very interesting, because then he even started uploading, the adversary started uploading new versions and other malwares. So that gave us a lot of information. Oh my goodness, what is he doing? What is he trying? He tried other passwords that had been compromised. And what we saw, for instance, in, in passwords is that a lot of people use counters. They have to change their password every 
six weeks every three months. So they use the name of their wife, number one, and then it's number two and number three. Now you can guess what the next one will be. So we saw a lot of people getting uh, compromised again because they used these kinds of patterns in, in their passwords. Now that stopped when, when my guys posted the document and we encrypted the document, so the document got stolen. Um, and the idea was, let's see how long it takes for them to decrypt it. Um, now, it was a stupid idea because they took the recipe for Flemish stew in Flemish. So, to be honest, they didn't come back. At a certain point of time, the action stopped. But we didn't know what took more time to decrypt the document or to translate the Flemish. So, it was a stupid idea. Has been said before, too, um, it's um, better to detect yourself. Trent Micro uh, published a statistic that 98% um, of the, the people uh, got informed by an external source. Now, that's incredible. Uh, that's a bad idea. You have to try to, to monitor your networks um, yourself because all intrusions leave traces. We have seen this morning the, the idea of the, the uh, kill chain. Um, it actually takes weeks to get very deep into a network, even more sometimes. So if you can detect the first phases of that attack, you're capable um, of stopping maybe the whole attack. And it's good to do monitoring, but please don't forget to protect yourself. Step one and level one is still having a good protection. And you need periodic board reporting and have incident handling procedures in advance, as everybody said. Now, there's one thing about incident procedures, incident handling procedures, you need them, but when something goes wrong, well, you must also be quite creative because you probably will not have thought of everything at that time. So my last point is that, to be honest, um, and my experience is that there are seldom lessons learned. We're talking now for like an hour on, on lessons learned. I prefer to talk about lessons identified. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I, I think we identified quite a lot of elements. And um, after hearing all of this, I, I think back to the first day when I was standing here, uh, well, on the third, when not all of you were here. Uh, where I was referring to the, the theme of the conference, which is about preparedness. So preparedness would be the key to success. I hear you mentioning plans and preparation, monitoring. So uh, knowing what is happening and being prepared uh, is indeed important. I was just wondering whether you think that from a government point of view, things should be enforced? Should companies be forced to be more ready? Um, to keep logs, to, uh, well, there is already some legislation in force, but uh, do you think that could be improved? Does anybody have And I, You, Miguel? Yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, I think you need a well-published, well-known, basic set of security measures, yes. Um, I don't really believe in, in the aspect of, in, of enforcing that, in the sense that I prefer to make people uh, responsible, make sure that they know what is the threat, what they should do, um, and give them the tools uh, to, to do it, give them directives and give them best practices. But really enforcing that, I think that's a bridge too far. Okay, how would you, how would you go about then to make sure that all the companies are informed uh, are well trained, know what the tools are? Um, every company does its own risk assessment. So if you're capable of publishing and, and um, I mean, we have a lot of ways to, to share information. Uh, look at the Belgian cybersecurity guide. Um, and if you make sure that, that people know that they are liable mm -hmm. uh, for their security and, and for what they are doing, what the risks are, that they are taking, I think that's a better approach than forcing, forcing. to keep logs for. Okay. I think you make, let people have, make an evaluation of their own environment uh, and they will keep uh, the necessary logs if they are uh, 
made responsible for managing that. You agree? Um, I must say, Fabrice? In, the, in the telecom sector, for instance, regulation exists already. Yeah. So uh, th there is a, a European directive which has been translated in Belgian law, uh, according to which we, we have to take security measure based on risk management and also to notify uh, uh, an instance in, in Belgium, which is the, the, the BIPT, so the regulator, uh, notify of the incidents, but also on the risk, and also the, the privacy commission in case of uh, privacy okay. data breach. Yeah. So it exists. I'm not sure uh, and that will be extended to other critical infrastructure through the, the new network and information so, uh, security directive, uh, which is under, under consideration now at the Council of EU. Uh, I'm not sure this is the best way to approach security. For sure, regulation should exist. Uh, we, we, we should be subject to, to some obligations. At least notify incidents, critical incidents, should be the basic of, uh, of uh, such kind of regulation. Uh, but for the moment, I think the best would be to, to, to raise awareness to, mm -hmm. uh, as, as Miguel said, really to, to, to make the, the company responsible for, for the security, but not, not only the company, trying to have such kind of collaboration uh, across the border of a company, uh, because this is not only companies, this is also big organization, uh, public organization, and so on. So for the moment, I would, I would plead for more uh, awareness raising in the, in the, okay. in the domain. Any, yeah? Well, I would say if uh, a company can uh, prove uh, that it's, uh, it has taken enough uh, uh, controls in place, uh, so installed, that uh, it would make it able uh, to um, process certain confidentiality levels, uh, especially then uh, in our uh, sector, uh, that you can choose uh, a level of a partner. Like, uh, mm -hmm. do you want to uh, transport uh, uh, very confidential information uh, we, uh, with um, uh, companies who do not adhere to a certain level? Uh, and yeah, you can have those uh, reciprocal uh, uh, um, checks that you can do yeah. uh, via the, uh, the assessments uh, in there. Uh, but indeed, uh, then from a commercial point of view, uh, it's um, for the companies uh, beneficial to adhere to the required level for that uh, level of confidentiality or availability. Yeah. And that should be then in the, the service agreement. Okay. Here, do you have a... Yeah. Well, I think, I think uh, government should, should really invest in, in, in building a, an integrated strategy uh, um, towards uh, a cyber, strategy, a cyber uh, security, mm -hmm. uh, which, which mainly uh, aims at uh, making sure that everyone's aboard. Uh, it's cyber security is a problem of uh, everyone in society, from mm -hmm. from uh, the, the, the user, from the mm. ch from the children up to the to the to the national uh, critical uh, infrastructure. Yeah. And I think there's there's um, there's um, a challenge and a responsibility for government to to make sure that there is a joint effort in raising awareness uh, that everyone's aboard and that. Uh, all at all areas at the same time action is being taken uh, action taken but at the same time coordinated by a supervising uh, uh, authority uh, mm -hmm. which does not impose itself in all the initiative uh, on the initiatives that are already taking place but uh, makes sure that everything uh, that there is no overlap that everyone is uh, doing is playing its role and that everything is going in the most efficient and effective way and i think that's that's the main challenge and that's a, in my view uh, um, a promising st that should be a promising strategy for belgium then are there any questions pressing questions <laughs> no I think we can conclude the panel with, uh, I think it was very interesting. Um, we learned a lot 
and uh, no, we identified a lot of things that we should be doing. Um, I want to reassure you, some of you were looking for dessert at noon. Um, <laughs> with the coffee, there will be some uh, sweeties for you. And then uh, after that, we will resume, I think, in quarter of an hour for the final sessions. Uh, of of uh, this Congress. Don't forget your evaluation forms uh, at the end of the Congress. And please, I invite you to the coffee break. And we'll be back around quarter to four. Thank you very much. Thank you.